uh, I'm new to the Vanier community. So it's been really beneficial for me both to participate in the summer school and in this week. Um, a bit about my background. Uh, I did a PhD at the Technical University of Denmark with my, uh, the main supervisor, Carsten Jacobsen, and co-supervisor, Christian Thuesen, which made me familiar faces. Uh, and I did it with collaboration with uh, Synopsis Denmark. And I worked on electronic transport uh, in these 2D transition metal dichococ knife transistors. Now I'm a postdoc at the Southern University of Denmark uh, with Professor Joel Cox and in the group of uh, Asker Mortensen. So the idea behind all of this project was that we would like to do feasible time-dependent simulations of extreme nonlinear optical phenomena uh, in nanostructure systems, which means nano ribbons, nano islands, uh, twisted layers, stacked layers. So basically systems with large supercells. Um, and how to do this in an efficient way. Um, so I had the idea to use vanorization because then we can really toggle the effective system size. We can go in and say, how many bands do we really need uh, in order to describe our system? And we also can get sparse Hamiltonians which can help with the memory of these uh, large systems. Um, so why don't we just use perturbation theory, which is the go-to method really for these uh, response uh, calculations? Well, it's because we want to look at the extreme nonlinear effects. And that's, this means we go to, to large uh, orders in the electronic field. So in linear response, you can get the linear response function relatively easily. If you go to second order, now you have, I think, at most 18 terms of some tensor. If you go further, it just sort of blows up. Um, and furthermore, we need quite um, intense electric fields for these things. So uh, saying that it's a small perturbation is also perhaps a bit of a, a stretch. So this is why we are going uh, beyond perturbation theory and, and actually just do uh, direct time uh, dependent simulations. The current project looks at high harmonic generation in uh, 2D nano ribbons. And just a brief uh, introduction to high harmonic generation, because I think there's perhaps not a lot of people who is uh, aware of this phenomenon. I didn't know it before I started working with it. But you can sort of explain it through this three step model, which is really for high harmonic generation in the gas phase. Um, and in the solid state, of course, it's more complicated, but this sort of conveys the idea. So if you have a very strong electric field, you um, perturb your potential and an electron can sort of be tunneled away from the nuclei. And then when you have the phase of the field changing, it sort of gets driven back and forth. And at some point it will recollide uh, with the nuclei and it will emit some radiation, which then is emitted at these integer uh, numbers of the uh, impinging field frequency. Um, and what P Professor Joe Cox has been uh, working a lot on is looking at this effect in uh, graphene, in different graphene uh, nano ribbons, nano islands, uh, and has shown that when you have these um, confined systems, which have some well-defined plasmonic resonance, then uh, having the field exactly at the frequency of this plasmonic resonance really enhances this high harmonic generation. So that's what we were, would like to investigate in other materials and other configurations as well. Um, and what we look at for quantifying this effect is the uh, dipole acceleration um, squared. And this is because it's proportional to the far field power spectrum. And basically this resolves this feature very nicely. Uh, we looked at graphene and phosphorine nanoribbons. Um, both of these have nicely tunable plasmonic resonances. So when you either chemically or electrostatically dope them, you can really change um, the precision of your plasmonic resonance. And they also have strong light matter interaction. Uh, in the case of graphene, we know that we have this plasmon assist assisted high harmonic generation. And it's also a nice benchmarking system because you can look at this 
very simple type binding model, which we've also looked at sometimes during the school, I think, where you just have a uh, nearest neighbor hopping, and then you can, can look at your result compared to that. Phosphorine is very nice because it's a semiconductor with high carrier mobility. Um, and some simulations on extended system has shown that it has potential to actually outperform graphene uh, when it comes to high harmonic generation. So this is our framework. I had to come up with a name. I didn't have a name before I went here this week, but I feel like everyone has a name for their code. So I've, I've made up a name, maybe it will change, but for now I call it XNOR for extreme non-optical, extreme non-linear optical response. And uh, the framework is basically that we do DFT ground state calculations using the DPAR package. Then we do a binarization with minor 90 to get the system in a binary basis set. Then I use the uh, DPAR once more to get the Coulomb interaction between Vanier orbitals. And then I feed it into the XNOR code, which then solves this equation of motion to get the induced dipole in frequency domain. And then I can look at linear and nonlinear response. And right now we uh, have two types of pulses we can input. Uh, the first is this very brief delta pulse, which is just like a, a small spark, which then sort of excites the entire frequency range. And the, and the output will then be the linear response, where we can look at the adsorption spectra and, and really localize these plasmonic resonances. And the other is a Gaussian pulse, where you have um, a full width have ma uh, maximum of uh, 100 femtoseconds, and you have the time dependent simulations to get your, your harmonic spectra. So now I'll move to some results. Uh, here are a comparison between three different, well, basically actually four different kinds of uh, descriptions of a graphene nano ribbon. This is a 2.5 nanometer ribbon with uh, six act termination. And so the green model is this uh, nearest neighbor type binding model. And you see that uh, it sort of captures the feature close to the frame level, but you don't have this asymmetry around the Fermi level and you don't have any um, edge state, obviously, um, in this case. Then uh, we have a binarization just using one orbital per atom where the initial projections is the PC orbital and then we get the correct behavior around the Fermi level. And we also have a more sophisticated model where we also get some of this spaghetti both uh, above and below these uh, PC bands. Um, and then below I show here the linear response where I changed the, the Fermi level position to see how the linear response uh, changes with doping. And we see this very nice tunability we have in graphene. Um, we don't have uh, any difference between electron and hole doping in the tight binding model. The two Vanier models agree relatively well. There is some <laughs> difference when going to high doping levels. And then I compare here to a DFT RPA calculation. And for uh, electron doping, it's, it's quite similar. For hole doping, there are some features from the DFT here, which our model doesn't capture. Then I looked at the plasmon enhanced high harmonic generation, again, using the three different models here. And basically, uh, what I show here is the, um, the color scale is this dipole acceleration. And, and the x-axis, we have the, the frequency of the field. And then we have the frequency of the emitted variation here. And on top, we have this uh, linear response. So here we have a plasmonic resonance here. And we see somehow that there is some um, larger high harmonic generation, but really it's definitely most clear in the case of the, the more advanced model where we have bands uh, also besides these uh, simple PC orbital bands. Uh, and of course it makes sense because when you have these very high harmonics, then you really do go and excite bands very far away from the Fermi level. So it is something which requires you to go 
to somehow sophisticated models, but I think uh, what we have here seems to be reasonable. Then I have some results for phosphorine. So now we have a band structure with a gap and a single, uh, no, actually, I think there's two edge states here. So we have uh, zigzag terminated ribbons and armchair terminated ribbons. And for the zigzag, I have one which is 2.5 nanometers and one which is five nanometers wide. And again, we have looked at the linear response with different doping levels. And I have a DFT calculation for reference, which now seems to, I don't know if you can see this, I think it's a bit light on this screen, but uh, otherwise you'll have to trust me that there's actually a really nice uh, agreement now between these two. This is slightly more sophisticated in the way that now I have four orbitals per atom, because in phosphorine we have a very strong SP hybridization, so you really can't get around with going uh, with less than that. And again, we see that there is nice tunability of these plasmonic resonances. So then I would like to look at the tunability of the high harmonic generation. Here is the high harmonic generation spectra for the six second armchair ribbon, uh, the short ones. And um, it's just to show how the spectra looks like. You can't really see the difference with doping here because it's just on top of each other. <laughs> but here I've looked at um, the intensity of the, the third, the fifth, and the seventh harmonic with uh, different doping levels here. And for this zigzag, wow, it's really, can you see the third harmonic? I can't. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's too light on this screen. Okay, anyway, it's really flat. And that's also what the, the plasmonic spectra show. So there's, there's not a lot of tunability for this zigzag ribbon, um, which, with the, which is not as wide, but if I go to over here to the right, I have the, the longer ribbon, the five nanometer ribbon. And here I get not a specific tunability. So not that just if I increase the doping, I get higher harmonic generation, but I have some doping levels, which is preferable and basically whole doping is slightly better than electron doping. Um, and for the armchair, I have a more consistent uh, sort of behavior here that if I increase the whole doping, I also increase the intensity of the high harmonic generation. So I took sort of the, the best doping level for these three nano ribbons and then I looked at how uh, how much I actually get enhancement from this plas plasma resonance. So this is the same uh, plot as I showed for graphene. And basically what we have here for the, the short zigzag ribbon is really that you don't have this clear plasmonic resonance. It's really just sort of a lot of small peaks. So you don't get uh, specifically large enhancement but for the armchair ribbon, you have a more specific peak and you get a nice enhancement. And if you then increase the length of the zigzag ribbon, now you start to really have these prominent peaks again and you get a very nice enhancement at this plasma frequency. So this sort of shows that the systems I'm working with is actually perhaps slightly too small to really get into these effects. So I would like to go to larger systems and we are pushing to get to five and 10 nanometers and this is possible, it just takes a bit more time. It's a bit more cumbersome to get everything uh, running. So uh, to summarize, I've made this new code. It's based on maximally localized linear functions and we can calculate these extreme non-linear effects. Um, if we benchmark against uh, response calculations from DFT, we get quite nice agreement. Uh, and we have used this to look at high harmonic generation, especially in phosphorine nanoribbons, where it hasn't been uh, investigated that much before. And we see that whole doping seems to show the strongest high harmonic signal, and we can actually enhance the signal uh, with these plasmonic resonances, and we can tune uh, also the, the effect both by the size of the ribbon and the doping level. That's all, thanks.
Thank you for the nice talk. So we have time for questions. Uh, again, if you're on Zoom, you can write the question in the chat or unmute yourself. And if you're here, just raise your hand. Okay. Uh, very nice work. And uh, I, I have a technical question about um, how you somehow vanierize your calculation. Do you, uh, do you import the Hamiltonian only? or also the position matrix elements? Also yeah. the position matrix elements. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So my question is because I, uh, we can I can show you the paper that I have in mind later, but there was a, a paper, I think the first author is Silva uh, three years ago, where- uh, rings a bell, yeah. yeah <laughs> where they show that these position matrix elements were off diagonal position matrix elements were quite important for higher harmonic generation uh, in their vanierized okay. scheme for also I think in real time. So I was just yeah, wondering if yeah. you if you made yeah. some comparison. Uh, no, no, but that would be very interesting to look at. Yeah. We have Giovanni next. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question on the, the graphene where you showed you have a model with one and one with three orbitals per atom. And you have some differences in the, your results. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like on the on the left, let's say. Uh, do you know why there's differences? Because you have missing bands, or is it because the, the shape of the bands or the Banyan functions is different? I think mostly it's because I have missing bands, okay. because it, the shapes are pretty well uh, replicated by the Banyan models. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so if not, we thank our speaker again. Second.